So my name is Rich D'Alessandro. I am an emergency physician. I also have been involved in EMS since I started my career as a medical student. Um, currently, I'm also the medical director for United Ambulance. Um, we've talked a lot about sort of the hospital side and, and, and how we treat these people, and hopefully you can understand that, you know, this is a pretty important thing and how there's a need to really address these. And you can also realize that these tend to be high-risk patients. They have a, a, you know, a lot of medical problems. They tend to have um, other potential social issues as well, which we've addressed. Um, what I really wanted to talk about is more of the EMS perspective, what we would do pre-hospital. For the most part, we're not gonna do anything necessarily different. I mean, we already, you know, <coughs> address injuries, stabilize, treat pain, and everything else, but I kind of wanted to just sort of underscore some issues um, and also realize that what you do and some of these other additional pieces of information that you can relay to the hospital uh, really makes a big difference because quite honestly, 99.9% .9 of the people who work in medicine have no idea how people live. We see them in the office, we see them in the hospital, they come in with an injury. We don't really know how it happened. We don't know what kind of environment we're going in, where they're going home to. Um, and so, particularly with people who have hip fractures, knowing some of that information early can really make a difference in potentially avoiding someone to go for rehab. Maybe we'll be able to get them back into their house. Um, these patients tend to fall a lot. Um, sometimes it's because of medication, but um, I'm sure everyone who has spent any time in the back of an ambulance has seen elderly patients who are alcoholics, who are subjected to elder abuse, neglect, and you guys can pick up on that. We're not going to be able to pick it up in the hospital. We might. Usually if we do, it's on the tail end of things when they're home and social work's getting involved. So. Recognizing some of those things, um, you know, can make a huge difference. Um, it's a lot easier when you're in a home, you can really pick up on all the visual cues of, you know, how safe they are, how not safe they are. Um, so I think that's really important. Um, a lot of times it's busy, you, you need to go, you know, back into service, and sometimes that information gets lost in translation. So, you know, I certainly think when you have concerns um, really making sure that information is passed on um, can really make a huge impact on that person's life. The other thing that I want to sort of underscore is um, pain control. These things hurt. They hurt a lot. Um, I don't know. Most people probably have in the room have broken a bone at some point in their life. may have been like a finger or a toe, and those are kind of painful. These things hurt a tremendous amount. Um, so really focusing on how you can make that person comfortable, how you can sort of uh, you know, stabilize them, get them out of the house in a safe way, in, a, in you know, the least painful way, really will make a big difference. Not only are these painful, but you know, they know that their hip is broken or they're worried it's broken. And they also know that means there's a good chance they're not going home ever, um, certainly not for a while. Um, so there's not only the pain, it's all the fear and stress associated with that. Who's gonna take care of my spouse? Am I gonna lose my home? All of these other issues. So the, the more you can make them comfortable from the get-go, it'll make the whole transition of care all the way through to discharge better. Early pain control really makes a big impact on every sort of clinical index that you look at on these patients. So with that, I'm probably going to jump around, so bear with me here. Um, basically, what we're going to do today is limit the discussion to not every type of potential hip injury. We're really talking about these isolated hip injuries. So these are ground falls or trips. Um, we're not talking about, you know, I fell off a ladder um, potentially. You know, uh, certainly most of the patients we're dealing with it, in this age group are elderly patients. Um, they tend to be more high risk. Um, most of their falls are less than three feet. I think everyone would agree, you know, an 80-year-old person 
who fell off a roof is not going to come in as an isolated hip injury, and we're going to reserve that comp topic for another day. So these are pretty much our ground level falls and trips. So talking about aspects of history, um, certainly, you know, th there, there are other issues. Most of the time these are pretty straightforward, but there are occasions where people um, can have falls for other reasons, as was stated earlier. Um, usually they're elderly patients, so there's lots of medications, lots of comorbid history, um, and you know, most of the time these are just simple trip and falls, but sometimes they're not. And I think it's really important to, when you initially assess your patient, to make sure you have a detailed enough history and the facts all seem to suggest that this is a simple trip and fall, and when it's not, to, to delve a little bit deeper. Um, a lot of times the patients will minimize their symptoms and, oh, it was just a little slip, no big deal, um, because they're afraid that if it's a bigger issue, they may find it's unsafe for them to, be, to go back to home. Um, there may be elder abuse issues, um, and there may be substance abuse issues. Um, I'm sure that uh, at all, at least at some point, you've had a gra grandma who came in who had one of her spells that the kids came by and she wasn't acting right, and um, you know, grandma's put a fifth of vodka away. Um, and it happens a lot, and, and more than people realize. So again, asking the right questions, you know, you guys are in the house, you can see you know, what the environment's like, those sort of clues really make a big difference. So again, you, you are the people who are gonna be the only witness to all of this, so really good information is important. Um, sometimes family is present. If they are, we strongly encourage um, them to either, uh, if possible, have a family member come with the uh, patient, um, particularly if um, there's a lot of fear or concern or agitation that having someone familiar can really help um, the person sort of keep their orientation, make them less agitated, make them less confused, um, and, and make, make it easier to control their pain and, and, and positive for everybody. Family members can't go, please make sure they know where their parent is going or their family member is going, um, and at least find out if they're going to be coming or not and at the very least get some contact information. Um, we need that information, we need to speak with those people. Sometimes there's other medical history we're not acutely aware of that may determine whether or not um, this is a person who's an appropriate candidate for surgery. Um, they may need surgery and, and they may not have the ability to be consented for surgery or understand what's going on and we're gonna need those people um, to be involved. So having that information um, can save a lot of time on our part, getting the patients where they need to go and, and the treatment that they need. Um, this is a uh, blatant advertisement. Um, United has a community paramedic, uh, paramedicine program. Um, the state of Maine uh, EMS has a pilot program. I think there's 10 or 12, is it 10? 12 programs, we have one of them. Um, in the changing healthcare environment, roles of what is being provided for people out of the house um, has been changed. A lot of it's based on reimbursement, so there's a really increasing role for community paramedicine. Um, and we've done a various spectrum of services from safety assessments to helping um, patients with medications. Anyone can be referred to this program. It doesn't have to be um, healthcare providers. We have uh, referrals in all our trucks. Right now, unfortunately, it's limited just to the LA area, although as of today, we've extended our service out to Leeds and Turner, and if things go well, we'll probably start extending that as well. So um, for those of you in Leeds and Turner, you'll be getting a lot more information shortly, I'm certain. So in terms of identifying hip fracture, this is pretty straightforward. Obviously, there's a trip and fall. They usually have pain related to somewhere, the hip groin or, 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 or that area. Um, usually, they're unable to bear weight. Um, usually, they're not even able to get up. Um, there's a lot of discomfort. There can be swelling and stiffness in the area as well. Um, classically, these extremities can be sh um, shortened and externally rotated, but that's not always the, always the case. Um, as Dr. Bush had alluded to, sometimes these femoral neck fractures kind of get impacted on themselves and there's really not a lot of shortening or rotation. Um, and, and those can, 
though those patients actually can move around pretty well and um, you can be surprised how many of those are fractured when you think it's just uh, just uh, you know sprained or bruised so um, there's always soft tissue injuries associated with fractures so there's going to be um, discomfort and depending on how they got injured that soft tissue injury may not be directly over their hip it could be more towards the, the SI joint, the back buttocks, or, or off to the groin. Um, and a lot of times that can be more painful than the fracture itself. Uh, some patients can develop hematomas. Um, and, you know, if they're more superficial, can cause a lot of swelling, distort the anatomy, maybe uh, uh, distract you from recognizing that there's a fracture. Uh, and sometimes they can be um, swelling in deeper tissue where you won't actually see any deformity, um, but can lead to um, some serious complications such as compartment syndrome. U usually those people um, have been on the ground for an extended period of time um, and that the, just because they haven't moved the pressure on the tissue causes a lot of edema and swelling um, and uh, sometimes uh, these patients are on anticoagulants. Um, there's a whole bunch of new anticoagulants on the market now um, so if you haven't been familiar with those uh, it used to be just all warfarin coumadin we now have all these uh, A-band uh, type drugs, Eliquis, Arelta, Pradaxa, um, and I'm sure there's gonna be tons more out. Um, so it's important to ask for those type of things as well. Uh, for those who aren't familiar with compartment syndrome, basically um, all muscle groups are bounded by layers of fascia, which is a, uh, it's basically like, you know, grizzle on a steak. It's a non-expanding, um, uh, fibrous membrane. It helps the muscles work more in an uh, efficient manner. Um, but what can happen is if there's damage in that, you can get bleeding or swelling. Um, because that capsule can't expand, the pressure increases and then you can cause damage to the tissue. So classically, we talk about having um, pain out of proportion to examination. Um, they can, as late findings develop, um, distal injuries to nerves and blood vessels, so the extremity distal can be, you know, have a low pulse, it can look pale, um, they can have loss of sensation, motor function. Um, so uh, again, just, you know, recognizing good documentation examination of the extremity above and below the area of injury, um, uh, as well as every time, you know, the, the patient's uh, uh, manipulated or, or uh, stabilized. So we talked a little bit about this stuff already, um, but just to recognize that pelvic fractures can happen with or um, without hip fractures. Uh, sometimes people can sustain pelvic fractures without a hip fracture. They can be quite painful as well. Um, and sometimes there can be lumbar fractures. Um, for the most part, uh, hip fractures tend to happen in isolation. There's usually not a lot of other injuries, particularly when we're talking about, you know, trip and falls. Um, the problem is when we see the person in the field, we don't have a diagnosis. So it's important to recognize that it may be a hip fracture, but it may be a pelvic fracture. It may be one of these other things. So this is pretty straightforward. Obviously any, you know, emergent life threats or compromise uh, need to be addressed first before we deal with any specific treatments to any extremity injuries. Um, you know, identifying the hip fracture, getting a good history we've already spoken about, uh, mobilizing the injury, um, analgesic for pain, and then obviously any potential um, complications if they arise. So I want to talk a little bit about spinal assessment. This is sort of the bane of everybody. Um, and what we have to recognize is, I have to apologize, I did have a slide that actually had the protocol on here, but uh, apparently my technology skills were a little um, suboptimal and the slide got, um, got lost in translation. Um, but you should all be familiar with that. Uh, if you look at it, it looks really great when you look at it. The whole right side of it is really straightforward, you know, with pain on palpation and, and all these other things. The other side is what really gets us, right? It all talks about, you know, the reliable patient distracting injuries. And that's always a problem. So if it was one or the other and you had an alert, calm, oriented, sober person, that's pretty straightforward. If they're obtunded or comatose, that's pretty easy too. The problem is it's a big spectrum and the difficult ones are the ones in the middle. The point 
that I want to emphasize here is that most of these patients aren't going to have these type of injuries. There, there, there may be some. Um, and the goal isn't to get it right every time, but it's to, the, for the patients that we can clearly, you know, avoid any sort of immobilization um, to do that. Um, you know, it's easy just to say, well, I just can't tell and immobilize everybody. The problem with that is it causes a lot of pain, stress, and discomfort for the patients. Often the transport times can be um, quite long. Often by the time they reach the emergency department, they've, re they've given, been given some form of analgesia as well, and it makes it rather difficult for us then to try to uh, clear these patients. Um, in the end, what it does is obligate them to potentially unnecessary workup and delays um, before they get definitive treatment for their hip injury. So, um, I guess I can just move on. Pain control, um, pretty much this is all following standard uh, protocol. It's screen 15 and 16. Um, if, uh, you know, I, uh, if you are a uh, ALS unit, then obviously fentanyl is, is indicated for those. Um, if it's not available, um, consider the use of nitrous oxide if, if available. Um, what I would say is that um, a lot of times we do get ALS called for intercept for pain control with these patients, which I think is perfectly appropriate. What I would like to offer to you is maybe thinking about calling for that earlier. Maybe even as soon as you get in the room before you've finished your full assessment. You've been in the patient's house, you know what it's gonna to take to evac that patient. Um, and you're gonna have some time before you're ready to do that anyways. So if you recognize that, um, you may even wanna think about calling right away. You'll cut down on some of the transport time. And then if the patient's safe and you can wait, leave them there and wait for ALS to show up and give the patient good analgesia before you even move them. Um, in a perfect world, we'd like to evac the patient on a backboard or a reef stretcher. Um, sometimes that can be really difficult. Some of the homes are old, they're narrow, narrow hallways, steep steps. Um, it can make it very challenging. Um, which is why I would argue that maybe good pain control um, prior to evacuating the patient would be a good idea. Plus, you may actually get extra manpower to do it. Um, sometimes, you know, the right way to do it is actually with some extra padding pillows, a scoop stretcher, um, and some extra straps, and keep the person on the stretcher um, in a position of comfort um, rather than uh, some alternatives. Um, if the, uh, well, you can read this, obviously. Um, just, you know, it, it, if there's no concerns about any associated injuries, you know, any way that you can transport the patient to the ambulance in position of comfort is best for the patient. Um, extra pillows is always a good idea, splinting it. Um, I would, you know, underscore that any time the patient's manipulated, you really need to reassess the extremity for, uh, you know, your CSMs. In terms of documentation, again, this is pretty much reiterating everything we've talked about so far. What caused the fall? If there's any concern for a medical condition rather than a straight mechanical fall, um, that should be documented. And again, if you can make sure that that is relayed to the hospital staff. Um, how long have they been down? How you packaged the patient, transported them, how they were moved into the uh, bed in the emergency department. Um, and all the other appropriate documentation regarding status of the patient, um, assessment of the extremity, um, and who you gave report to.